these immense machines uh, with uh, uh, a power that's almost unimaginable to humans applying themselves to the earth in a very destructive way. What those pictures of mountain removal mining represent to me is our willingness to destroy the world. I mean, that much of the world as it was given to us is now destroyed forever. There's no conceivable way that it could ever again be what it was or have the value that it originally had. But this destruction is only the most extreme example of our willingness to destroy. At the time of the destruction of the World Trade Center, I had a, a, a trip scheduled to fly to San Francisco in the next few days. And of course it was called off, but it was certainly on my mind. And uh, I don't like flying anyway. I don't like airplanes. I don't like machines. I don't like to be inside a machine. And I don't like to be off the ground. And to me, the catastrophe of September 11th was a kind of ultimate horror. The idea of people in a passenger plane uh, being thrown into a building to destroy it um, was a frightening to me. The, the morning that happened was a very beautiful morning here, and I had loaded a load of corn in my pickup truck. And I went around, got in the cab, and when I started the motor, the radio came on with that news. And I just sat there, uh, dumbfounded, and listened. And one very long after that till my son came and he'd heard it and he'd come right straight to me to say, Dad, cancel your plane reservation. You're not going to go on your trip. And so that's that's the way I heard about it. It's very, very clear to me. The two things that I've heard about, I remember exactly where the news came to me. One was Kennedy's assassination and the other was the, that terrible episode of the World Trade Center. The important thing is not the, uh, the particular circumstances. The important thing is that when a person's scared, a person ought to do something about it. Uh, there's no point in just sitting and shivering. And uh, so I wrote that piece in order to, to collect my thoughts and make as much sense as I could. That seems to me the proper antidote to fear is to, to dig in and make as much sense as you can. So that was the reason uh -huh. for writing that. In fact, it's the reason I've written all my essays because I've been um, a badly scared man for a good many reasons. Chiefly scared about what we're doing to our our country, I mean the country itself, not the nation. Although what we're doing to the nation it seems to me sufficiently frightening to cause a lifetime of essay writing. Well, it still seems to me that the idea that a domestic airplane loaded with people can be used as a weapon is devastating. And uh, it does really very serious damage to our optimistic assumption that we can make these huge machines and somehow uh, control their effects. Uh, I don't think we can control their effects. 
we are not controlling the uh, effects of um, their exhaust, for instance. Uh, we're, not, we're not in control of the pollution that's coming from these economic activities and, and these economic machines that we've made. So in some sense, uh, the events of September 11th seem to me to uh, stand for the incalculability of technological effects. If the official uh, people had learned anything, I think they would have changed their tune. And if we've learned anything in the last uh, five years, it is that official people very reluctantly change their tune. If a significant number of people had learned anything, I think they would have forced a change in the way officials are talking. And uh, they haven't done that. So I don't uh, see that the events of September 11th have in any meaningful way uh, registered on the conscience or, or, or the consciousness of our people. Is there anything in there the last five years to give you hope? Yes. Uh, the thing that, that uh, gives me the most hope, I think, is um, the stirrings of conscience in some people. I think that the effort that is growing and has grown in the last five years to foster local economies starting with local food economies, is hope-giving. And I think the spread of consciousness here about uh, mountaintop removal in the mountains is hope-giving. I don't think it tells us uh, that we should be confidently hopeful mm -hmm. yet but it certainly tells us what hope is going to look like, and it tells us what to hope for. And that is that somehow we'll learn to curb our violence, that we'll learn to take appropriate care of all the irreplaceable gifts we have that can't survive our carelessness. Thoughts in the presence of fear.
The time will soon come when we will not be able to remember the horrors of September 11 without remembering also the unquestioning technological and economic optimism that ended on that day. This optimism rested on the proposition that we were living in a new world order and a new economy that would grow on and on, bringing a prosperity of which every new increment would be unprecedented. The dominant politicians, corporate officers, and investors who believed this proposition did not acknowledge that the prosperity was limited to a tiny percentage of the world's people and to an ever smaller number of people even in the United States, that it was founded upon the oppressive labor of poor people all over the world, and that its ecological costs increasingly threatened all life, including the lives of the supposedly prosperous. The developed nations had given to the free market the status of a god and were sacrificing to it their farmers, farmlands, and rural communities, their forests, wetlands, and prairies, their ecosystems, and watersheds. They had accepted universal pollution and global warming as normal costs of doing business. There was, as a consequence, a growing worldwide effort on behalf of economic decentralization, economic justice, and ecological responsibility. We must recognize that the events of September 11 make this effort more necessary than ever. We citizens of the industrial countries must continue the labor of self-criticism and self-correction we must recognize our mistakes. The paramount doctrine of the economic and technological euphoria of recent decades has been that everything depends on innovation. It was understood as desirable and even necessary that we should go on and on from one technological innovation to the next which would cause the economy to grow and make everything better and better. This, of course, implied at every point a hatred of the past, of all things inherited and free. All things superseded in our progress of innovation, whatever their value might have been, were discounted as of no value at all. not anticipate anything like what has now happened. We did not foresee 
that all our sequence of innovations might be at once overridden by a greater one. The invention of a new kind of war that would turn our previous innovations against us, discovering and exploiting the debits and the dangers that we had ignored. We never considered the possibility that we might be trapped in the web work of communication and transport that was supposed to make us free. Nor did we foresee that the weaponry and the war science that we marketed and taught to the world would become available, not just to recognize national governments, which possess so uncannily the power to legitimate large-scale violence, but also to rogue nations, dissident or fanatical groups, and individuals whose violence, though never worse than that of nations, is judged by the nations to be illegitimate. We had accepted uncritically the belief that technology is only good, that it cannot serve evil as well as good, that it cannot serve our enemies as well as ourselves that it cannot be used to destroy what is good, including our homelands and our lives. We had accepted, too, the corollary belief that an economy, either as a money economy or as a life support system, that is global in extent, technologically complex, and centralized, is invulnerable to terrorism, sabotage, or war, and that it is protectable by national defense. We now have a clear, inescapable choice that we must make. We can continue to promote a global economic system of unlimited free trade among corporations, held together by long and highly vulnerable lines of communication and supply, but now recognizing that such a system will have to be protected by a hugely expensive police force that will be worldwide, whether maintained by one nation or several or all, and that such a police force will be effective precisely to the extent that it oversways the freedom and privacy of the citizens of every nation. Or we can promote a decentralized world economy which would have the aim of assuring to every nation and region a local self-sufficiency in life-supporting goods. This would not eliminate international trade, but it would tend toward a trade in surpluses after local needs had been met. And my Lord, he said unto me, do you like my garden so pure? You may live in this garden if you keep the water. 
of the gravest dangers to us now, second only to further terrorist attacks against our people, is that we will attempt to go on as before with the corporate program of global free trade, whatever the cost in freedom and civil rights, without self-questioning or self-criticism or public debate. This is why the substitution of rhetoric for thought, always a temptation in a national crisis, must be resisted by officials and citizens alike. It is hard for ordinary citizens to know what is actually happening in Washington in a time of such great trouble. For all we know, serious and difficult thought may be taking place there. But the talk that we are hearing from politicians, bureaucrats, and commentators has so far tended to reduce the complex problems now facing us to issues of unity, security, normality, and retaliation. National self-righteousness, like personal self-righteousness, is a mistake. It is misleading. It is a sign of weakness. Any war that we may make now against terrorism will come as a new installment in a history of war in which we have fully participated. We are not innocent of making war against civilian populations. The modern doctrine of such warfare was set forth and enacted by General William Tecumseh Sherman, who held that a civilian population could be declared guilty and rightly subjected to military punishment. We have never repudiated that doctrine. It is a mistake also, as events since September 11 have shown, to suppose that a government can promote and participate in a global economy and at the same time act exclusively in its own interest by abrogating its international treaties and standing apart from international cooperation on moral issues. And surely, in our country, under our Constitution. It is a fundamental error to suppose that any crisis or emergency can justify any form of political oppression. Since September 11, far too many public voices have presumed to speak for us in saying that Americans will gladly accept a reduction of freedom in exchange for greater security. Some would maybe, but some others would accept a reduction in security and in global trade far more willingly than they would accept any abridgment of our constitutional rights. In a time such as this, when we have been seriously and most cruelly hurt by those who hate us, and when we must consider ourselves to be gravely threatened by those same people, it is hard to speak of the ways of peace and to remember that Christ enjoined us to love our enemies. But this is no less necessary 
for being difficult. forget that since the attack on Pearl Harbor, to which the present attack has been often and not usefully compared, we humans have suffered an almost uninterrupted sequence of wars, none of which has brought peace or made us more peaceable. The aim and result of war necessarily is not peace but victory and any victory won by violence necessarily justifies the violence that won it and leads to further violence. If we are serious about innovation, must we not conclude that we need something new to replace our perpetual war to end the war? What leads to peace is not violence but peaceableness which is not passivity, but an alert, informed, practiced, and active state of being. We should recognize that while we have extravagantly subsidized the means of war, we have almost totally neglected the ways of peaceableness. We have, for example, several national military academies, but not one peace academy. We have ignored the teachings and the examples of Christ, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and other peaceable leaders. And here we have an inescapable duty to notice also that war is profitable, whereas the means of peaceableness, being cheap or free, make no money. Then my Lord, he said unto me, do you like my garden so free? You may live in this garden if you keep the people free. And I'll return in the cool of the day. Now with the cool of the day. Now is the cool of the day. Oh, this earth is a garden, the garden of my Lord. And he walked in his garden in the cool of the day. The key to peaceableness is continuous practice. It is wrong to suppose that we can exploit and impoverish the poorer countries while arming them and instructing them in the newest means of war and then reasonably expect them to be peaceable. We must not again allow public emotion or the public media to caricature our enemies if our enemies are now to be some nations of Islam, then we should undertake to know those enemies. Our schools should begin to teach the histories, cultures, arts, and languages of the Islamic nations. And our leaders should have the humility and the wisdom to ask the reasons some of those people have for hating us. Starting with the economies of food and farming, 
we should promote at home and encourage abroad the ideal of local self-sufficiency. We should recognize that this is the surest, the safest, and the cheapest way for the world to live. We should not countenance the loss or destruction of any local capacity to produce necessary goods. We should reconsider and renew and extend our efforts to protect the natural foundations of the human economy, soil, water, and air. We should protect every intact ecosystem and watershed that we have left and begin restoration of those that have been damaged. The complexity of our present trouble suggests, as never before, that we need to change our present concept of education. Education is not properly an industry, and its proper use is not to serve industries, either by job training or by industry-subsidized research. Its proper use is to enable citizens to live lives that are economically, politically, socially, and culturally responsible. This cannot be done by gathering or accessing what we now call information, which is to say facts without context and therefore without priority. A proper education enables young people to put their lives in order which means knowing what things are more important than other things. It means putting first things first. The first thing we must begin to teach our children and learn ourselves is that we cannot spend and consume endlessly. We have got to learn to save and conserve. We do need a new economy but one that is founded on thrift and care, on saving and conserving, not on excess and waste. An economy based on waste is inherently and hopelessly violent, and war is its inevitable byproduct. We need a peaceable economy. It's a very economical essay, and it's able to be economical because of many years of, of other writing in which I'd worried the same issues. 
So there's something a little reductive about this. Uh, it, it's really a series of poems. A num well, it's a numbered sequence of poems uh, that, that exist um, without their supporting arguments or evidence. It's amazing how current it is, and it's also uh, depressing how current it is. Uh, what you hope for is that these things you write out of fear at the way things are, you would hope they'd become obsolete and that the, the unhappiest uh, part of my life as a writer is that the things I've written when I was most scared have stayed current. Mm. I wrote, published in 1977, a book called The Unsettling of America about uh, what we're doing to our farms and our farming people and our farmland. And it's become more pertinent every year since. That's a terrible fate for a writer. Mm. The book was written in the hope that it would help to make a correction. And uh, so was this essay, obviously, uh, written in the hope that it would be uh, a part of a correction. And. Uh, that it has failed is really too bad. Mm. You'd be a fool to expect a sudden change. Uh, and I'm, I, I don't think I'm that kind of fool. But you'd not be a fool to expect uh, leaders to take notice of obvious problems. That isn't foolish. And it seems to me that our leaders, and I don't, I'm not talking about a party either, I think the leadership is guilty now of failing to notice the obvious. I think that my experience of living on the place that Tanya and I have and have made here um, has made me more hopeful. Um, we've made a conscientious effort for 40 years to take as good care of it as we can. And I think the place has responded and it's, I hesitate to say this uh, because I, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but I think it's a better place for the care we've given it. And we certainly are better people for the care we've given it. And this seems to me to be uh, hopeful in the, in the deepest way. Uh, because we've proved to ourselves that we can take care of our place. And of course, that long a caretaking for a place um, makes you flinch at the thought of somebody running at it with a bulldozer with the idea of profiting from something that's underneath it. The place, whatever anybody thinks, is the surface. And the surface, I'm increasingly convinced, ought to be considered inviolable. But it ought to be something we would break only with the greatest reluctance and maybe with the greatest compensatory ceremony 
Uh, the idea that you could just run at a place with a big machine and tear it up seems to me to be sacrilege. I think that uh, the world is a work of God and therefore sacred. And so how you treat this sacred work, how you make your own work in it is a matter of the most frightening importance. I don't think any of our current excuses uh, justifies the abuse that we keep showing ourselves to be capable of. And I don't exempt myself from this. I would like to be exempted uh, from the violence of this society, but of course, I understand all too well that I'm implicated in it. Every time I drive my pickup truck, for instance, I'm implicated. I'm part of the problem. We've got somehow to do better. And I don't think we can produce this better uh, individually. I think we have to do it as a society. Mm -hmm.